Welcome everyone, happy Friday, and welcome to the final Project Blue live chat of the year. We're so grateful for all that have tuned in over the past couple months, and we cannot wait to roll out our even more in 2021. Our guest today is Brina, Brianna Fodor of the Aquarium of the Pacific. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome and we, we're glad you could join us. We'll be doing a Q&A following her presentation, so please feel free to ask any questions you might have in the Q&A function or in the chat below. Like I said, our guest, uh, Brianna, is a senior aquar aquarist at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, a UCLA alumni. She worked at the Aquarium of the Pacific since 2009, climbing up from intern to now senior aquarist. Thank you again for joining us, Brianna. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks for introduction. Um, as you said, yes, I am a senior aquarist at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Um, as an aquarist, I am responsible for the care of many different types of marine fish and invertebrates. Um, one of these is our population of abalone. I am currently the lead aquarist working on our white abalone restoration program, where we are working with various other partners throughout California to try to restore a very endangered species of abalone called the white abalone. So what exactly are abalone? Uh, most people, when they first hear the word abalone, probably think of either their very colorful shells that can be used for jewelry, home decor, even fashion, apparently, um, or also as a food option that is such as the one pictured here. While the shells are quite beautiful, um, they are also actually a very important animal that live in our ocean. So abalone are, in fact, a marine snail. Um, their shell has a row of holes that are used to breathe remove waste, and also for reproduction. They have a very strong muscle called their foot that they use to attach uh, to rocks. This is so strong that sometimes it actually makes it really difficult to remove an adult white abalone. Uh, tentacles also come out from under their shell, as you can see in the picture at the bottom. Um, these are used to sense the environment around them. Abalone don't see shapes or colors, but only see shadows. Um, this helps them to be able to react if a piece of algae floats near or over them, um, which is their main food source and um, allows them to know that it's there so they can reach out and grab it. Um, there are uh, found in actually in um, pretty much every ocean all around the world. Um, here off the coast of California, we have uh, seven different species of abalone. These are the pinto, flat, red, black, green, pink, and white abalone. Um, and this picture, you can see their distributions all along the coast of California. So the species of, of abalone the Aquarium of the Pacific is assisting in restoring is the white abalone. Uh, white abalone were actually the first marine invertebrate to ever be put on the endangered species list back in 2001. They live at depths from six feet all the way up to 200 feet. They can range in size from about 20 to 25 centimeters and can live up to 40 years, um, becoming sexually mature around four years old. They are found just offshore um, of the coast, typically on rocky banks, and their diet consists of different species of algae. As adults, white abalone typically don't move very far. Um, there's actually a video um, that you can look up where it's a, um, one white abalone, it's the 48-day time lapse of the same abalone sitting on the same rock for those 48 days, um, only moving to turn in circles and wait for algae to kind of come and uh, float by. So uh, why do we care about abalone? Um, abalone do play an important environmental role as they consume drifting algae. Um, and they're also act as a food source for many different other uh, marine animals. For thousands of years, coastal Native American people ate abalone and used their shells. Um, abalone shells were uh, used for trade, uh, some um, being found as far as the east of the Mississippi River. Um, however, an increasing demand of abalone mean abalone shells led to increased efforts to harvest these animals. Um, you can see in these pictures just the astounding amount numbers of abalone that would be harvested at a time. Um, all those piles, it's kind of hard to see in these pictures, uh, are just piles of abalone shells. Uh, white abalone in particular were targeted as a delicacy because supposedly they had a particularly good flavor. This is a graph showing the white abalone harvested in thousands of pounds from 1940 until the fisheries were closed in 1997. Essentially, there was a 99% loss of abalone in only a decade. The demand for abalone nearly wiped out the entire population, and what remains now is below the baseline for sustaining a population naturally. Now there are so few individuals left in the wild that the likelihood of a male and a female living within range of each other is practically zero. 
So to uh, make things worse, also in the late 1980s, a disease called the withering foot syndrome um, began to be observed in wild abalone populations. Now this is a bacterial disease that affects the abalone's digest digestive tract, causing them to waste away and unfortunately eventually die. Um, this also contributed uh, to reducing the numbers of California abalone. Um, now, although abalone are no longer um, allowed to be fished in Southern California, Southern California, <laughs> poaching is still an issue and also leads to reduced numbers. So abalone are slow growing animals, which means it um, also takes them um, a few years before they are able to start reproducing. Also abalone are broadcast spawners, which means individuals release uh, sperm and eggs into the water in hopes of fertilization. However, for this to be successful, a male and a female should be within about 10 meters um, which is about 30 feet of each other. Um, however, unfortunately, there's so few white abalone left in the wild, it's almost impossible for this to happen naturally anymore. So in the late 90s, the government decided to step in to put a halt to abalone fishing and work to hopefully recover the white abalone species. First, the abalone fisheries were shut down in 1996 and 97. In 2001, the white abalone were listed as an endangered species. Since the abalone in the wild were so scarce, it was decided to collect 20 individuals to bring into captivity to work on restoring this population. Abalone farms have had success in raising abalone for food purposes, and their procedures were adopted to raise white abalone as well. In 2001 and 2003, there was some, some, some success in raising white abalone from that original wild collected group, um, and the Aquarium of the Pacific eventually did receive um, some of these individuals from the 2001 uh, spawning. Um, we still uh, currently to this day have some of those individuals. In 2011, the UC Davis Bodega Marine Lab took over the program and have coordinated the efforts ever since. So now in 2008, the Aquarium of the Pacific joined the White Abalone Recovery Program, where we received eight individuals um, back from that original spawning attempt with the, um, the uh, wild population. We received funding from the National Marine Fisheries Service section of NOAA to assist with the care of these individuals and also to assist us to build a proper system for spawning and raising abalone at the aquarium. Although these institutions were some of our uh, initial partners for this program, there have been many more that have joined the efforts in raising this endangered species uh, since then. So what does it mean for the Aquarium of the Pacific to be a part of the White Abalone Recovery Program? Well, first of all, we have abalone. Um, we actually have over 60 white abalone currently at our facility. Now these range in years from um, 19 all the way down to two years old. Uh, we have an abalone exhibit it's pictured here. Um, this is uh, uh, usually available uh, for the public to see. Um, in this exhibit, we keep both uh, adult white and red abalone. Uh, the red abalone we actually uh, uh, ended up having in order to uh, practice our spotting techniques. Um, since they're much more abundant, um, we wanted to kind of perfect with them before starting on the endangered, the more endangered white abalone species. So with this exhibit, we were able to share with the public our role in the white abalone recovery program. Um, and also just educate people aware of the status of white abalone and um, even the fact that they're off our California coast. So now I thought I'd take just a quick break from abalone um, and kind of talk about what my job is as an aquarist, since it is kind of a unique position. Uh, I am responsible for the care of fish invertebrates that we keep at the Aquarium of the Pacific. I personally have six systems I'm responsible for. These includes me, um, feeding the animals inside the system, making sure that they're healthy and doing observations, um, cleaning their exhibits, as well as maintaining the behind the scenes filtration. Um, at the Aquarium of the Pacific, each of our exhibits has its own set of filtration behind the scenes. Um, this picture here is behind the abalone exhibit that I had just shown in the previous example. Uh, just to kind of give you a reference point, the blue, um, if you can, um, that blue light there is just above the water um, where the abalone are. Um, all, of the, the, all of the components in this picture are all what help uh, filter the water and keep it clean and make sure it's safe for the, the abalone living and the animals living inside. So this is my volunteer, Sandy. Um, she's cleaning all of uh, one type of filtration called filter bags from my exhibit. Um, she was very proud of herself for the say I will say because she's pretty sure she had set a world record for the most filter bags cleaned at one time. Um, but these are used, uh, water leaving the tanks where the animals are, goes through these filter bags first, and um, that helps to pull out any large uh, particles or um, waste that's in the water. Um, I will say abalone eat a lot and they also poop a lot. So I are, <laughs> one of my daily tasks is just cleaning um, these every day. 
Um, as an Aquarius, I also do get to spend a lot of time diving. Um, we dive in our exhibits to clean as well as to care for our animals. We use underwater power scrubbers to clean our large exhibits. Um, kind of a rare project um, in the left picture is um, uh, one of my coworkers using an underwater drill to um, drill holes into our largest exhibit, um, which is where we put some of our artificial coral. Um, but one perk of uh, working in an aquarium that's located right on the coast is that I do get to get out and do a, a good amount of field diving. That's me pictured in the, one of the, my most recent dives on the right. Um, we have a collecting permit um, at the aquarium that regulates what type of animals and how many we are allowed to collect off our coast. And also as an aquarist that works with Southern California animals, I am able to dive in environments um, where my animals are found which also allows me to get a better sense of um, where they live naturally, their habitat, and um, ultimately helps me care for them um, better back at the aquarium. Um, being able to do the field diving at the Aquarium of the Pacific has also helped uh, a lot with the White Abalone Recovery Program, um, but I'll get back into that in a little bit. Also, since I care for the majority of our abalone, I am in charge of making sure we have food for them. Um, what we mainly feed our abalone are giant kelp or macrocystis, um, we are, uh, again, fortunate we're able to um, drive boats out to the, uh, just outside of our um, aquarium at the Long Beach break wall in order to collect um, this important food for them. Um, this is my co uh, coworker Valerie showing off a, a particularly nice piece of kelp that we had just collected. Um, I'm sure you can tell um, with her mask on that this was a picture taken during quarantine. So even though the aquarium um, was closed on and off throughout um, the COVID pandemic, uh, we uh, as husbandry staff and aquarists still continue to work and care for our animals, and I still would go out at least once a week to get kelp for the abalone. I'm also responsible for our abalone culture system. Um, this has all the components that are needed for spawning abalone. There are both male and female abalone, as I had mentioned earlier, um, and they release their sperm and eggs into the water in hopes that a sperm meets an egg and fertilizes it. Um, now, when we do this in captivity, it's, it's much more controlled than it would be out in the ocean. So first what we do is we'll separate individual adults into buckets and try to identify if they are a male or female, um, which honestly can be really tough um, unless you know for sure that an individual had either released sperm or eggs in the past. Um, I should note here that we do uh, tag all of our adult abalone or adult white abalone so that we're able to um, ID them, um, keep records of them, and also helps with doing a yearly assessment on the animal. Chemicals are added to the buckets of water, um, and this help initiates the animal to spawn or release its gametes. The picture on the left is of a female abalone. Um, all the brown around her are her eggs. And then on the right is a male abalone as he's releasing sperm. Um, we're collecting it for the spawning. Um, the Aquarium of the Pacific actually coordinates these spawning events with another local aquarium called the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Um, this is about a 15 to 20 minute drive away from us. Um, which is really important in case each facility only has one um, sex that are spawning um, during this day. So for example, if at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we had only a male spawn, but the Cabrillo Aquarium had a female, then what we could do is drive either the sperm or eggs over across the bridges to the other facility and, um, su and successfully have uh, fer fertilization. So if we do su successfully get both sperm and eggs, we mix these based on a recommended concentration, concentration of each. We allow them to be mixed um, for a certain amount of time before rinsing the mix through screens that are uh, too small for the eggs to go through, but large enough for the sperm to pass through. Um, this is to avoid the eggs getting fertilized by multiple sperm, which would not allow for successful development of that egg. Uh, once fertilized, the egg develops into an embryo. These are placed in bins, uh, bins that are up above the trough um, in the picture on the left. And um, as uh, they develop, they turn into more of a swimming uh, larvae. So they'll swim up and out of uh, an overflow in the tanks and down into these buckets that are pictured here. And um, this is where they'll continue to develop in the buckets until they're ready to settle, which is pretty much when they're ready to attach and start growing up into an abalone. Um, so here are just some cool um, pictures of different stages of development of abalone. Um, and then as part of the culture system, um, we also have uh, these troughs as pictured in the right with ceramic tiles that are inside. So what we do is we allow these to get covered in diatoms. Um, this is a type of algae that very small abalone like to eat before they grow up and are able to start eating the bigger, like the giant kelp um, pictured earlier. 
Uh, after just an, about two under two weeks uh, post fertilization, abalone should be ready to settle. As I said, that's when they're able to leave their sweeper, uh, swimming uh, phase and attach to a substrate. Um, when the larvae are ready to settle, we put them into these troughs, um, again with the tiles with the diatoms, and kind of hope for the best and hope that they attach on. So at this stage, they are so small, it is almost impossible to find them or see if we were successful. Uh, here you can see the size of abalone after just two months in that top left picture. Um, one clue that we can um, use uh, though to see if we have been successful are feeding traces. Um, in that bottom left picture, if you see all the little white circles um, in the diatoms, um, that's from a little abalone eating, uh, eating around itself. So you can kind of see a close up on the, in the right picture there. So as you can see in these pictures, abalone are very slow growing. Um, to the right are the size of our abalone at just one year old. Currently we, um, we are holding abalone that were born in 2018 that are still only under a couple inches long. Over the past couple of years, Bodega Marine Lab has been able to raise around 40,000 white abalone uh, with the ultimate goal of being able to release all of these into the wild after a few years of getting them to be a little bit bigger. Um, what the Aquarium of the Pacific helps with that is that um, we are able to accept abalone at small stages and allow them to grow to the size that they need to be before we can release them. So just one quick cool fact about abalone um, and their shells is that uh, the, especially at early stages, their shell color is actually related to the diet. So what algae they're eating. So you, with these, you can see that really clearly the, um, the different lines from different types of algae um, eaten. So once again, so the Aquarium of the Pacific is located very close to one of the locations where adult white abalone have been observed in the wild. Due to this, as well as our ability to conduct field diving observations, we also participate in the fieldwork portion of the white abalone restoration program. Now this includes conducting underwater surveys on scuba, as well as assisting with releasing abalone out into the wild. When we conduct surveys, we have divers from NOAA, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and a local organization called the Bay Foundation. Now, um, this is a picture from before COVID. Um, we would charter a local dive boat, take us all out to the dive sites, um, and then each team on the boat would be assigned a different task to do underwater at the survey site. Uh, unfortunately, in March, we stopped these operations once everything was shut down, um, but have once again resumed them in September, but kind of with different and safer practices. Uh, we, each organization will take their own boats to the dive site with limited capacity on each boat. And then um, we kind of decide on everyone's tasks before um, we actually start the dives. So initially we began by surveying various sites around Palos Verdes looking for adult white abalone and also for an ideal location for um, hopefully eventually releasing um, them in the future. So in this picture you can just kind of see what the location of the survey sites which is in the black circle on the left just related to the um, location of the Aquarium Pacific, which is the yellow star on the right. So you can see it's fairly short, but right, just kind of around the point to get over to the to those dive sites. So the way the surveys work is one team puts down um, what we call a baseline, which is pretty much a very long uh, tape measure. It has every meter marked along it. You can see that us laying them down in the pictures up at the top. Um, we place these by using compasses underwater. Um, usually the baseline runs along the coast and then um, each of the buddy teams is assigned a different mark along that line and then we will run lines again um, perpendicular to that that main line and then that ends up being our survey. So we'll lay, lay out the line, survey along that line and then um, at the end of the dives uh, we roll everything back in and kind of um, uh, kind of uh, update each other on what we saw. So. So I have a video, let's see if get this going. So this is a, just a video of one of our dive sites. Um, you'll see in a second too, the, um, the baseline and the survey line going through. Sorry if that's really loud too, I can't control. But uh, I'll just let it go first.
So it's just, um, that was actually one of the clearer days too that we were out diving. I, was, I had to get this video from, um, I think it was a, a survey in 2017 that we had help with. Um, but just to give you an idea of where we're working, um, typically we're, our depth is around between 60 and 75 feet. Water temperature is usually in the 50s, um, so it's a little bit of a chilly dive. Um, as you can see, the terrain's usually flat. Uh, this video didn't really have a good shot of it, but there are very large um, like uh, rocks and rock work that kind of come up in certain spots too, where we'll find abalone occasionally. Um, we do get to see multiple fish species. There's a few in here. Um, you can kind of see them on the left, actually, in this end picture. Um, but we have seen some really cool fish too on these dives. Um, even uh, we had a giant sea bass one time that was hanging out during the entire survey, following divers around. Um, even one time I've seen a seven gill shark, which is really neat. Um, so it's kind of a cool dive spot. So I have one more video for you guys, and it is of an adult white abalone, um, just to kind of show you how, um, how kind of tricky it can be to see these guys out there. So if you see him, he's right there. And there he is in relation to the line, the dive site. All right, so um, once again, uh, initially we were mainly looking for these adult white abalone that had been reported to have been seen off of Palos Verdes. Um, so this video just kind of again shows you uh, what it looks like and how tricky it can be sometimes. Sometimes it's, you're just lucky and you happen to land right on an abalone. Um, also, um, there are other species of abalone out there when we're surveying, so we do have to confirm what species it is um, before recording it. Uh, the way that we can decide between different abalone species is by looking at the shape of the shell, uh, the, their uh, holes or the, um, the color and the size, and also um, the uh, tissue color of their body um, also will help us to decide the species of abalone. So if we find one or if we found one, we would take measurements, um, obviously let the whole team know because it's pretty rare to find a new white abalone out there. And um, the, again, I had, I had mentioned before, the one nice thing is they don't really move. So um, once we find one, we, we usually are able to come back um, and find it again. So that's kind of makes things helpful sometimes for us. So in addition to looking for white or for adult white abalone, um, we also worked on conducting habitat surveys, um, looking for, again, a, a very suitable location for our abalone release. Um, but we also did predator surveys because we were hoping to find a place with maybe less predators um, that would really go after these really tiny juvenile abalone that would be pretty easy pickings for animals. Um, so the primary suspects are California sheephead, our spiny lobsters, uh, giant uh, spine stars, and uh, probably the hardest one to find, the octopus. If you guys can see it in the left corner, he's right in the center of that picture. Um, so by far the harder ones to find when we're out surveying for them. So again, the ultimate goal of this program um, was to be able to successfully release juvenile white abalone into the wild in numbers that would eventually be able to sustain this population uh, naturally. So one cool thing we were able to do back at the aquarium um, was assisting in trying out different ways of releasing abalone. So here are some pictures of one of our initial release methods. Um, the goal for these uh, cages was to put the abalone inside, allow the abalone to kind of acclimate to their new environment, Eventually, they would open them up just brief, uh, just a little bit so that abalone could kind of crawl out on their own. And um, the cages were meant to protect the new juvenile abalone uh, from the predators, at least initially. So um, we helped with this in 2017. Uh, we filled the cages with a bunch of juvenile white abalone that were um, eventually going to be released. Um, the nice thing um, with this exhibit, this is one of our Southern California exhibits called Amber Forest. Um, so it's a sim it runs at a similar temperature to what they would find out in Palos Verdes. And um, the, the great thing with this exhibit though, is there were no uh, predators of abalone in the exhibit. So if one did escape on accident before we um, wanted to try anything, then at least we knew that it would be safe inside the tank, which they did escape and we did have to end up finding them. But um, we also would feed uh, kelp into these cages uh, about once a week to make sure that I've only had food throughout the study. And it ended up providing us some really valuable information that um, kind of helped us change and um, figure out a really good way to release them back out in the wild. 
So last year we were able to uh, release our first uh, captive raised juvenile white abalone into the wild. Yay, very exciting. Um, they were released at two different sites. One was uh, off of San Diego and then the other was a site off of uh, Palos Verdes or Los Angeles, um, one of our survey sites. Uh, since then, I think there's been two releases, but there's been a total of 4,000 abalone released between the two sites. It's about equal, so 2,000 at each site. Um, and currently, we are uh, assisting with surveying the site in Palos Verdes, uh, where they were released, um, just to see if we are able to find them. And we're still um, surveying for predators and also looking, unfortunately, for any shells of abalone that didn't quite make it. So. So one last thing that the Aquarium Pacific also assists with is doing a nutritional analysis of um, two primary food types for the abalone. These are agarum, which is the right algae up top, and then um, macrocystis or giant kelp, which is the, um, the picture at the bottom. So we send uh, samples that, of these algae that we collect at the uh, survey sites that we work at and um, send them to a lab and we analyze them for calories, moisture, protein, total fat, carbohydrates, total dietary fiber, ash, calcium, and iron. Um, now over the study, we have seen that there are seasonal differences in nutrition of the algae. Um, and, uh, but in the end, it looks like that agarum may have been a little bit more nutritious than the kelp, um, but uh, not, not by much. Um, but what we do is we um, are able to collect agarum when we are out there doing our field surveys and we'll bring them back to the aquarium um, kind of for a special treat for all of our abalone that we have. So what's next for Aquarium Pacific and our white abalone program? Um, so our grant was just renewed last year by National Fish and Wildlife. And so that gives us another five years, um, which uh, will all go towards, um, again, keeping our animals, upgrading the tanks that we have for them. Um, but also um, helps to pay for our field surveys as well. Um, we'll obviously continue to care for our abalone at the Aquarium Pacific. Uh, we still will keep our adult white abalone and use those potentially for spawning events in the future. Um, and again, we'll also be able to help by receiving smaller juvenile abalone, raising them up to a bigger size and then um, getting them ready to release in the wild. So unfortunately, field surveys are back put on hold now um, that California is shut down again. Um, we were meant to go out again in January, but that's going to have to wait and we'll kind of just kind of play it by ear and see how everything plays out. So I've really enjoyed being a part of this project and being able to work with some really amazing scientists all dedicated to saving this endangered species. I would like to thank the Aquarium of the Pacific for assigning me to this program and I'm looking forward to be um, continuing to be a part of it. Now this work is also thanks to support of our members, donors, and foundations. All of your donations feed our animals, provide education, and conservation programs such as the Wide Abalone Recovery Program. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you very much. And yeah, go abalone. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Brianna. That was awesome. All right. So we have a couple questions. Um, to start off with, uh, like I, like we were talking before, um, can you just take us through your your career path a little bit? Is is this a project that, you know, obviously you you learned about it through your years in at UCLA or go Bruins, anyways. <laughs> um, but um, is there is there uh, is this something you've wanted to do and study since you were little or what can you take us through that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I I've known for a pretty long time that I wanted to do something marine science related. Um, I started volunteering when I was in high school at a small uh, local aquarium called the Sea Lab, um, and I I pretty much even before I went to college I knew I was going to do marine biology. Um, so uh, in school I actually uh, ended up doing I got uh, well I got scuba certified and ended up doing a lot of field work. I was um, a a dive assistant to a lot of uh, graduate programs and different, all, honestly, all around the country. Um, and I loved doing the field work and the hands-on. I hated the rest. I hated the lab work. So I knew I had to find something that was going to allow me to do diving and hands-on work, um, but um, not necessarily being in the lab as much. So after college, I um, got an internship at Aquarium of Pacific, and I just fell in love with everything about being an aquarist. So um, I pretty much was an aquarist, or an intern. The next year, I became a part-time aquarist, and then later that year, full-time. And I've been there since. So I've been um, I've been at the aquarium since 2009. So um, the abalone program um, was kind of I had actually started working with it in probably about 2010 or 11. Um, 
But then my duties at the aquarium changed. Um, we occasionally switch around what areas we work in. So I actually went from working with our Southern California animals to only with tropical Pacific animals. So completely switched. And um, I ended up just coming back to the Avalanche program um, only about a year ago. So I'm still kind of trying to catch up on everything with it. But uh, um, but yeah, that's kind of where I've landed back again. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's really, it's, it's very different than a lot of things I do at work. So it's been really great, so. That's awesome. So, so you brought it up a little bit, but you've been at the Aquarium of the Pacific since 2009. Yeah. Um, where, have you see, where have you seen growth there? What encourages you about your studies you've been doing um, you know, a, with, with, the, with the topic of climate change becoming so present in our, our daily conversations from you know, Washington, DC to the local areas? Um, what's been encouraging in your work that you've seen? What's been worrisome in your work that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, honestly, things in general, I think, are, are getting better. I mean, I think one big thing that the aquarium really helps with is just making people aware of all these problems. Um, we just recently had, well, last year, um, we, we created a new expansion that did really touch base with a lot of um, environmental issues going on and kind of really trying to push ways to, that um, humans and people can help, even, you know, just in small ways. Um, so I think it's getting, I think, better. And yeah, I mean, just again, even just seeing, you know, people become aware that there are animals in the ocean. Um, I, I have this one memory from when I first started. I, I worked in guest services where, you know, selling tickets and everything when I first started at the aquarium and um, seeing a school group coming in and the kids had never seen the ocean before. So they, first of all, were like, that's the ocean. And, you know, we're located on a harbor. So I mean, technically it's the ocean, but it's not the ocean. So just seeing them that excited to see the water and then for them to walk through and realize that there's anim all these animals live in the ocean too was really cool. So um, yeah, so I think, you know, it's the aquarium, I think does, uh, aquarium Pacific does a great job with just teaching the public about, you know, ocean um, issues or any kind of environmental problems, but then also trying to offer some solutions as well. So, um, and then again, and we get to help with some cool projects like this too. So the White Avalanche Program, we do work with a giant sea bass as well as been kind of a new one for us um, and other things too, not just marine um, ocean based. Like we use some stuff with penguins and um, other animals too, the birds that I don't know. So yeah, but. <laughs> Got it. Um, so we have a question uh, kind of related. Um, Heather asks, what has been the most challenging and most rewarding parts of working with white abalone? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think most rewarding, um, I mean, honestly, was being able to see all those abalone released into the wild. I mean, that's been a thing that the Aquarium Pacific and all the other partners have been really working towards since 2008, I think, was when we first started this. Um, so seeing that happen and, you know, again, um, I just I was on a phone call with them kind of updating on what we've found on the surveys this year. And it sounds like we're still seeing individuals out there from the out planning we did last year. So it's it's working, which is really exciting and great. Um, most challenging, you know, I don't know. I, again, I'm, I'm still kind of new back to this program. It's been kind of a year anyways to be back in the, the program. But uh, from what I remember when I first started it for the aquarium was um, us kind of um, perfecting the spawning. So getting... Um, uh, the animals to be able to settle and actually getting baby abalone out of it. Uh, luckily, uh, Bodega Marine Lab up north has really perfected it. Again, I think they again they had like forty thousand individuals just over the past year, which is crazy. So, um, so that, I would say that would be the most challenging. But got it. Um, okay, so we have a couple questions. Um, so one from Kim is. Do the white abalone eat the invasive sargassum that has that we have in Southern California? I don't believe they do. Um, I haven't tried it before. Um, I think they're more um, interested in eating more like blade-like algae. So like that kelp and the garm I had shown before. Um, but I, I don't know that they eat sargassum. I, I don't know. I can tell you one way or the other for sure. But yeah. Okay. And then Christina asks, is there a difference between how long the abalone live in captivity and in the wild? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, to be honest, typically animals in captivity live longer. Um, that's because they don't have any predators. <laughs> so, or we make sure that they are not in a tank with their predators. Um, and we're also able to really, you know, you know, obviously provide healthcare. Um, believe it or not, abalone can have treatments and they can have medical treatments, you know? So, so I typically, in general, they're longer. Um, I don't know that there's any data or there, um, there probably is, and I just don't know it, um, comparing, life cycle or lifespan in the ocean compared to what animals we have in captivity. 
Got it. Got it. Um, oh, Heather asked another one. So when you do the abalone surveys, are you trying to go to the same trans transect lines every time or move around to different areas within your study area? Yeah, so initially we were moving around. Um, we were trying to find uh, the perfect spot for us where we initially wanted or eventually wanted re to release abalone. Um, but now that we've decided on a spot, we go to actually to the same exact spot every time. Um, so we have, uh, you know, the GPS coordinates, we have buoys down there. Um, we actually, we do ha have left a permanent line as well so that we're able to be pretty consistent with where we're surveying um, just so that um, was, uh, like this year we, we were doing it monthly since September. So we want to try to go back to that same spot, survey the same exact spot or same lines and um, especially to go back and look for those those release cages like I had pictured before, so. So um, so kind of one of my own questions. Um, we've been seeing a lot of reports, especially from Scientific American put out a study a couple months ago where we were thinking, everyone thought that because of the pandemic, we'd see less pollution and we'd see less, less um, you know, cleaner air. And the Scientific American said that the oceans have actually gotten have gotten worse. The pollution, the plastic pollution there has gotten way worse. Um, have you seen that affect uh, the abalones or in your research at all? Um, I personally haven't seen it. Um, the diving we've been doing since then have been um, that same spot off of Palos Verdes and then I've dove off the Long Beach break wall. And to me, both looked great still. I didn't see anything where I was personally. So I don't know that I can say one way or the other, but um, yeah, so from just from what I've seen, it's it's been the same, so. Got it, got it. All right, so you brought up dives. Um, so like I told you before, we have, a, we have a dedicated fan, Ryan, who always asks what your favorite ocean is. Um, and I'm gonna throw a little bit of a twist. Where's the favorite place you've, uh, you've dove um, and researched? And then of course, what's your favorite ocean? So it's really not exciting and it's kind of sad. So I've actually dove in a lot of really cool places. I've, uh, I studied abroad in Morea, which is an island off of Tahiti. And then I've done diving in the Bahamas and various tropical places. But to be honest, diving in Southern California is my favorite by far. So doing, if you have a great Cal Forest dive off Catalina with like 100 foot, foot visibility and you'd see, it's just, it's amazing. It's completely different having the kelp like completely around you. It's just, it's by far my favorite diving is, yeah, just Southern California. So not super exciting, but <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, and the ocean has to be Pacific because I work at Aquarium of Pacific. <laughs> of course, yeah. there you go. That's the overwhelming favorite, it seems, of all the panelists. Um, yeah. So, um, so let's. Could you take us through like a day in the life of your job for you know people that might want to get into this field? Um, what does it look like uh, pre-pandemic, during pandemic, post-pandemic? Yeah, so our job is, I mean, honestly, it's kind of stayed the same. Um, I have worked throughout the entire thing, and so is all of the husbandry staff. Because um, unfortunately, well, unfortunately for the animals, they really don't know that there's anything going on. So we still have to do everything as normal. Um, the one thing that has changed is we, I mean, during pandemic, we did cut out any extra projects. So all field diving was stopped. Um, anything extra that we would normally do. Um, typically, we do, um, Aquarius will go on like different to conferences or travel for collecting trips um, or various like conservation efforts. Um, but everything, all of that was all put on hold for the pandemic. Um, but yeah, a typical day for me, um, again, I'm, I'm responsible for certain animals and certain tanks. So um, in the morning we do uh, what we call rounds. Um, so I go around to every tank and make sure the pump's running, the filtration is running properly, the temperature is um, at the right um, set point for that tank. Um, then I'll do uh, rounds out front and make sure the animals look healthy, animals look okay, um, see kind of what I need to do for the day. So like let's say a window's dirty or I need to you know fix something that fell over. So I'll do that. And then um, yeah, for me personally, a big part is uh, diving in the tanks at the aquarium. Um, I, in addition to abalone, I take care of our largest uh, living tropical coral exhibit, um, which requires a lot of, work, <laughs> of diving work. So I um, usually dive three to five days every week for about an hour each time. Um, and yeah, in general, just yeah, feeding the animals also is part of it. Um, yeah, we uh, all kind of pitch in to help too with the bigger tanks. So um, we have a couple of really large tanks that um, you have to feed the animals at different stations so that they all get their food that they need, but also don't kind of fight each other for food. So um, we help with that, but uh, yeah, lots of feeding, lots of cleaning and then diving, so. Got it. What's your, okay, uh, what's your favorite part of the day? Like what, what gets you up in the morning and you're excited to go to work? 
Um, well, I mean, just even working with the, just being with the animals is great. You know, it's um, super rewarding, especially when we were open to the public. Um, it's great to, you know, spend a lot of time really taking care of the animals and keeping the tank clean and working and then seeing guest reaction to what we've been working on. It's a little different now um, since we haven't had guests in a while, um, at least in our inside areas. Um, so, um, but it's, I mean, we're still need to be there for the animals one way or the other. So it's still great to do that. Um, and honestly, at diving, I love diving. That's really what pushed me into this field initially. So um, anytime just being in the water is great, so. All right, so we had, we had touched about this beforehand, before the webinar. Um, so we have a lot of, uh, you know, high school students that might be watching, high school teachers that might wanna relay a message to their kids that might be interested in this, in this field. What's your, what's your advice for a high school student, middle school student, college student that's, that's taken a liking to this field? Yeah, so my biggest advice is to start interning or volunteering like, as soon as possible. Um, it's kind of a unique field, as I said. So um, typically the only way really to learn how to be an aquarist is by um, volunteering or interning. Um, there are a few programs around the, uh, the, yeah, around the country that uh, are college programs that are de dedicated just to training people how to be aquarists. Um, but those are kind of rare. I think there's only a few. So it's really just getting that hands-on experience is really important. So um, uh, for the full-time aquarist job, at least at Aquarium of the Pacific, we require a college degree as well, just a bachelor's. So that's important to get as well, so. So you mentioned internships. Um, do you have any that you recommend that you help out with, grad programs, that kind of stuff, the like? Yeah, yeah. aquariums typically have um, some kind of an Aquarius internship. Um, I'm actually at the aquarium, um, our Aquarius intern liaison. So I hire um, our Aquarius interns. Um, unfortunately, that program for us has been put on hold with everything. Um, cause we're minimizing how much staff that we have behind the scenes cause we have kind of tight quarters. So um, we've only brought back a couple of volunteers and um, yeah, interns, the internship unfortunately is gonna be put on hold for a little bit, um, but I'm sure other aquariums, the, the, some that are probably more open have probably started that back up again, but we just haven't got there yet, so. Got it, got it. Um, well, I, I, there are no more questions coming in. Um, so I think that about wraps up. Do you have any final, final words? Um, you know, life advice. Life thoughts. advice. <laughs> Get in the ocean, learn how to dive. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> Not bad at all. No, I guess um, I think one thing I'm um, just right now, um, I'm sure everyone's aware, but aquariums are really struggling. You know, I feel like aquariums are, are super important to help um, just teach the public about, again, the ocean environment and things that we can do to help. So I do recommend trying to support your local aquarium any way you're able to. So. Um, especially the ones that are closed, you know, we get our money from ticket sales mostly from people attending. So any kind of help that anyone's able to do with any aquarium is really great. So yeah, are there are there membership options they can buy in the, in the last month of the year for potentially 2021 to reopen? Yeah, I think we are still being um, doing uh, aquarium memberships. I'm not quite sure the details. We were when we were still partially open, and I think. I'm sure now that we are closed, they would extend it um, in some way. But yeah, I mean, we're still offering any, all of that as well, so. Perfect. Well, uh, Brianna, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Um, it's been awesome. Um, we had a lot of good questions coming in. And like I said earlier, this is our last Project Blue live chat of the year. Uh, we'll be announcing upcoming live chats after the New Year's. So make sure you keep your eyes glued to all to see social media and their website. You can find them at mostly everywhere at, at Altacy or altacy.org. Um, but until then, happy holidays from everyone at Altacy. Hey, again, thank you so much, Brianna. Sure, thanks, Jacob. Yeah, it was great. Thanks, guys. Bye.